Well, um, Exodus 17, hopefully you're there. And what we've been seeing, um, like I said, it's been a few months, so let me give us a bit of a, a, a recap and, and review as to some of the things that we've been you know, looking at here. Because what we've seen is just God's great deliverance of Israel out of Egypt, right? And just miracle after miracle. Now, what's interesting is when you go through the book of Exodus and you look at that Exodus of Egypt where God was bringing them, right? Uh, there are several stops along the way. Uh, we like to refer to them as the, the seven camping spots of Israel as God brought them out of Egypt. How many people love camping here? All right. Way more than I would have thought. Okay, some of you do love camping. I myself, um, I'm not sure yet. I, you know, I like, I like um, you know, I like camping when it's just kind of short term when the weather is nice my my kind of memories of camping right was always like you know as a kid uh you know those canvas tents that you used to use right yeah you, you open them up they're they're just like brittle breaking apart you know they're musty smelling right you remember those right see that's my memory of camping so camping wasn't always great and then oftentimes you know camping around the lower mainland you know, it's like a 95% chance that it's going to rain when you're camping, right? And those tents were not very good in the rain, right? You'd wake up sometimes and there's literally puddles in your tent, right? And you're just like, this is not, so that's my, my memory of camping. So it's not been fond of it, right? But here's Israel and they are going through several camping spots in their exodus out of Egypt as God is leading them and bringing them to their promised land. Now that's gonna be taking a while for Israel because there are lessons to be learned along the way. And a lot of that is just lessons learned in these camping spots that God was bringing them to. What's the first spot that they came to? Sukkoth, chapter 12, verse 37. That meant tents, tent town. Because you see what God is teaching Israel here is that, listen guys, you're gonna be pilgrims. You're gonna be sojourners in this world. You are not gonna be those that are looking to set down deep roots. You're gonna be on the go as God is gonna be moving them. And we recognize the, the, the lesson for us, the application for us is that we recognize this is not our home, right? We're just passing through as pilgrims in this world. Just like it was great when we got to fold that tent up after camping. And oftentimes you just wanted to leave that tent there. You don't even wanna bring it back home. You don't wanna see it again. Just leave it for the next group. I'm done with this. You wanna leave it behind. You can't wait to go home. That's kind of the attitude we have now. Passing through this world, we can't wait to get home. And this is not our home. Home is heaven for us. So the next place that came to then was Etham, chapter 13, verse 20, which meant with them. God led them along the wilderness, but he'll be with them and will strengthen them. And remember, how did he reveal to Israel that he was gonna be with them? Anybody take a stab at it? Thank you, Pastor Jeff. That's right, pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Not just being a visual presentation or a visual realization of God's presence, but God caring for them in ways that they would need because here they are in the wilderness, right? In the desert. Guess what? The Middle East, gonna get pretty hot, isn't it? What are they gonna be looking for? I need some shade. Pillar of cloud, God provides shade for them in the day and then it gets very cold at night. God becomes a pillar of fire at night to guide them and just warm them. God providing such care and love for them. What's the next stop that they came to after that? Anybody wanna know? If nobody guesses, Pastor Jeff will give us the answer. He knows it all. He's got it all down. No, it's good, Jeff, that was awesome. Anybody know the next spot that they came to? Jesus, Jesus is the, always the right answer. That's right, thank you, Brent. They came to Jesus, that's good. <laughs> that's always the answer. You just when you don't know, give out the answer, Jesus. That's good. Third spot they came to, better just tell it to you because I don't wanna. They came by the Red Sea. Now that's a, a, a great work that God does here, but at the time, Israel's not too excited about this. 
Why? Because here they come now to the Red Sea. In other words, they've got the sea in front of them going, what are we gonna do? They've got mountains on either side of them that are not gonna be easy to get over with the amount of people they have. And they got, they got Pharaoh's army, Egypt's army bearing down behind them. They come to the Red Sea and Israel feels trapped. They feel boxed in and they're wondering, God, what are you doing for us? You brought us here, you've been the one leading us and now you bring us to a point where, and what do they do? They all start to say, Moses, did you bring us out here just so that we would die out in the wilderness? They thought, that's it, we're doomed, we're done, we're goners, it's been a great trip so far. A couple camping spots have been okay along the way, but now this is the end, we're done. But remember, God brought them here, why? because God was going to demonstrate his power. God was gonna reveal his might and do it in a way where he says there that I'm going to gain honor over Pharaoh because now Pharaoh and all of Egypt will see my hand at work. They will see me work because you're in a point now where he says to Israel, you can do nothing. In fact, what does Moses say? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. There are times where God brings us to places where we feel boxed in, where we feel trapped. We feel like, what are we gonna do? And we like to try to claw and scratch our way out of it, but God sometimes just wants to bring us to this point where he says, stand still and see what I'm gonna do. Because it's gonna be beyond you. It's not gonna be about you. It's gonna be for me to demonstrate my power and might and for me to gain honor and glory in this situation. That's what the Red Sea provided for Israel. Guess what, God, you know, open the waters, they came through, and it was a wonderful opportunity for Israel to see, God, yeah, we can trust you. When it seems like there's no way, we can just say, Yahweh. <laughs> yeah, there's a way. It's found in God. All right. Number four. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Okay. Mara. So remember, after they come through the Red Sea, they come now to a point where uh, they find a, a spring and they go to grab that water. They're like, oh man, we're thirsty. We're there, they're on the desert. We're thirsty. They got that water when I was bitter. It's not good. And they just begin to complain and murmur again. This becomes a very kind of perpetual problem for Israel, as we'll see. Even tonight in our text, when we eventually get there in the next hour or two. But just review. This is good, right? We need this. So. Um, so they come to the water now and it's bitter and they begin to murmur. But then remember what Moses was told to do? What did he, what was he called to do? Somebody? Hit the rock. Hit, okay, no, not coming up. You're jumping ahead. That's coming tonight. You guys had it. David had it. You got it. What? Yeah, I threw a stick in the water. I threw a stick in the water. And the thing, and they began drinking. It becomes sweet. It's good. What does that tell us? It's like, man, we're going to have times where perhaps we go through bitter experiences, but things get turned around when we take it to the cross. I think that, that, that stick, that tree that's thrown in is, is a picture of the cross that makes all things sweet, man. We go through harsh times, difficulty, sin sours us, but when we take it to the cross and we find forgiveness and life in Jesus, then things become sweet again. Next, after Mara, they come to Elam, chapter 15, verse 27, which means palms. And this was just an oasis, palm trees all around, right? And again, just God providing after those difficult, bitter experiences, God leads them to times of refreshing so that they can be renewed and strengthened in him and continue on. Next place they come to is wilderness of sin, chapter 16. And that's interesting, wilderness of sin, who wants to end up there? But you see, after those mountaintop experiences that they've been through, they've seen God at work, they've seen him do miraculous things, they've had those times of refreshing, the reality of the world can begin to knock us around. We need a fresh experience, a daily meeting with the Lord. What happened in the wilderness of sin? God began to provide manna for them. A, a daily outpouring of God's provision. And what did that manna teach us? Remember Jesus says, hey, your fathers ate of the manna from heaven, but I tell you, I am the bread of life. And, and, and Jesus began to, to reveal how he wants to feed us, and that manna became an incredible picture and reminder as that manna came 
early in the morning, they would get up and they'd partake. But they'd partake of only what they needed for that day. If they took more, they thought, I gotta stockpile this. I gotta build up for tomorrow or next week. What would happen? It would spoil, it would go bad. Every day, they had to get up and partake of that manna for themselves. That was a great reminder of how every day, we need to feed off of Jesus Christ and the word, the bread of life that nourishes us and strengthens us. We can't rely upon yesterday's devotions or last week's sermon. We need a fresh daily encounter with Jesus and that was provided for them there in the wilderness of sin. Next stop they're gonna come to that we're gonna get into in chapter 17 is Rephidim. I'm not gonna tell you what this is about here. We're gonna learn this as we go through Exodus chapter 17. And notice what we read here in chapter 17. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord and they camped in Rephidim. There they are camping again. But there was no water for the people to drink. So the Lord once again, notice this, moves them to give them another test, to teach them a lesson. That's what is being developed in them through each of these stops that they come to, these camping spots. They're times of testing, times of, of growing and maturing and, and equipping them. This was all about growing Israel in trust and dependence on the Lord. Now, though this would be a stretching time, notice it says that this is all according to the commandment of the Lord. Do you see that there in verse one? It's all due to the, uh, to, according to the commandment of the Lord. See, they were in the will of the Lord, yet they went through difficulty. There's no water for the people to drink. How do you think they're gonna handle this? We're gonna find out here, and I think you know, but they're in the will of the Lord, guys, but they still faced difficulty and hardship and times of testing. We can easily surmise oftentimes that when I go through difficulty, not me personally, but when we, you know, go through, I know you're all surmising why I'm going through difficulty at times, but when we go through difficulty, we can all surmise, oh, maybe that's a result of sin. Maybe that's a lack of faith that I have in the Lord. Maybe it's done because of a, a, a foolish action I've taken or something that I've, I've done. But there are times God brings us through times of stretching so that we can learn to just trust the Lord and have the Lord build into us the necessary qualities to grow our, our, our characteristics as a follower of Christ. The Lord will lead us to these times where we're tested, but we're tested so that we can grow, right? Lessons that we wouldn't learn without that refining, without that refining kind of circumstance in our life. Well, let's read here, verse two. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So once again, we see the people of Israel quickly resorting to their true colors. They've just very recently seen God provide in this exact situation. They've seen it in Mara. They've seen the wilderness of sin. Water turned sweet. Manna came down from heaven. They've seen God provide in just very recent times. And yet now, they resort once again to grumble mode. They just begin to get bitter themselves. They begin to complain and contend against Moses. They fail to simply turn to the Lord and ask for help. They forgot his mercy. They forgot what the Lord is able to do. This is a shame because in contending with Moses, they were actually contending with God. So Moses says, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? See, more accurately, they're, they're testing the Lord. And I think many of you would know that's never a good thing to do. They're contending and testing and tempting the Lord. We need to realize that all of our dissatisfactions in life are really revealing a disappointment with God. Are there areas that you're dissatisfied with that you're just like upset and grumbling over? Those ultimately are a reflection of your 
disappointment with what God's doing. Because when we complain, we're saying that we're not happy with how God is working in this present situation. We're not happy with what God is doing in and through this. Israel, you see, is needing to learn that in times of trial, they need to turn to the Lord and not turn on the Lord. So we can do oftentimes, isn't it? Where something happens that we don't like, we don't want to be in a certain situation, and we begin to shake our fist at God. We begin to turn on God. Why have you allowed this to happen, God? Why, could you, why would you do this to me? Instead of turning on the Lord, we need to turn to the Lord and ask him for our, our help. Ask him for his help. Ask him for those mercies to be new again every morning that we read about. Israel should have remembered that and began to seek the Lord rather than just complain. Besides, here's the thing, God's led them there. They should have quickly realized, wait a second, we've been following the cloud. We've been following the pillar at night. This is exactly where God took us. And so if God's taken us here, then God's going to meet our needs here. God's going to provide. God's going to take care of us because God's in this. He's brought us here. We need to be careful that we don't begin to grumble and complain and contend with the Lord. There's reminders of that throughout scripture. Psalm 95, seven to nine says, today if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. Psalm 78, verse 41. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Oh, may we never... You, you know, when we complain and grumble, we're limiting God. We're saying, God, why have you done this? What's, what's the matter? What's happening? We're, we're limiting God. We're, we're failing to see that God's at work and God's with us and God's gonna do a work in that and lead us through. Look at how the people of Israel were complaining here. Israel complained, first of all, by demanding God's provision. Right there in verse two, they said what? Give us water. <laughs> That's bold, isn't it? Give us water that we may drink. They were insistent on things getting done their way and in their timing according to what they wanted. Do we ever do that? Do we get a little irritated and demanding when things aren't lining up with what we want, with our wishes, with our comforts, with our desires, when things aren't kind of coming into line, do we ever get a little bit irritated and demanding? We have to recognize God is in control. And we need to trust him to meet our needs according to his will and not our own. So they're demanding God's provision. Secondly, they're denying God's protection. In verse three, they said, why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children? I mean, they just go right to the, the, the most darkest, <laughs> bleakest scenario. They're hungry or they're thirsty, but right away they go, you brought us here to kill us, and not just us, but our whole children and our livestock and everything else. That's it. We're goners. We're done. They went right into the worst case scenario without even giving God a chance. They assumed the worst, and in so doing, they're denying that God would be able to see them through. Lastly, we haven't read this verse yet, but in verse 7, we see that they doubting, they're doubting God's presence. Because they say in verse seven, if you just want to jump down there with me, right at the end of verse seven, what do they say? Is the Lord among us or not? They're doubting his presence. Just because they didn't readily see water before them, they began to doubt that God was even with them now. Maybe God just abandoned us. Do we, do we in like manner ever allow our circumstances to be the gauge of whether God is with us or not? Do you allow your circumstances to be the gauge for feeling and wondering if God is with us? First of all, we never want to base anything on our feelings. Based on the word where his word says that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. So whatever we encounter in life, we never have to doubt God's presence or his presence or his provision, I mean, or his ability to help us and to see us through. We never have to come to that place of just questioning what God's doing. We can easily question God's faithfulness because things aren't unfolding the way we want them to, but it's a real tragedy 
in doing so because we end up tempting the Lord and causing ourselves unnecessary worry. If Israel could just, you know, stop and recount the already incredible ways that God has already shown himself faithful and good and merciful in leading them out of Egypt and delivering them through so many things already and providing for them already. If they could just stop and see what God's already done. But they have the spiritual amnesia, failing to see who God is and what he's able to do, even when things look very bleak as they did for Israel here. You know, Paul uses these examples to further strengthen the church to be living in a manner that that pleases God. He writes in, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 9 to 11, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Let's not complain. Let us not tempt the Lord. Let's not do these things. Israel is a model and an example of doing that, but never to their good. It was never something that helped them. These were lessons that they had to learn so that we could learn them as well and not have to be in that place of tempting the Lord or complaining and being, you know, grumbling over these things. So reading on here in verse four, so it says, Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. I mean, it was getting bad. These guys weren't just grumbling. They're like, Moses, if we're gonna die, well, we're taking you out first, man. Like, we're not gonna be the only ones here. Like, they're ready to stone me, he says. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So once again, Moses becomes the, the target of the contentious, contentiousness of the people of Israel, right? They're all just kind of directing this, this anger towards Moses to the point where they're ready to stone him. But again, like we saw, we know in reality that in contending against Moses, they're really contending against God. And, and we have to be so aware and careful of that. When we begin to complain and grumble and we can often find ourselves complaining with other people, trying to garner a little bit maybe sympathy and support. But understand in, in doing that, you're, you're murmuring and complaining against God. Instead of coming and saying, hey, man, it's a tough situation I'm in, but man, I just need to pray and, and look to the Lord here to strengthen me and see me through. Let's see the attitude we need to have in these things. So they come contending with God. So what does God do? He equips Moses now with something that was very familiar to Moses. He says to him, Moses, I want you to go and, and take your rod. Take in your hand your rod. That was that instrument that Moses has already seen God just exercise his power through. Moses has already seen great things that God has done. And so now Moses is kind of having, again, that, that boldness uh, being you know, worked in his life, that, that faith kind of being exercised in his life because he's already seen this tool be a conduit for God's display of power. Now this, however, would still be a pretty big step and requirement of faith, wouldn't it? Because what does God say? Not just take up your rod in your hand, but go to the rock in Horeb and strike the rock and water's gonna come out. Oh, okay, that sounds pretty natural to me. Right, You're, I mean, for Moses, like, take the rod in your hand, great, okay, that's good, I've seen great things, awesome, now go and strike the rock. Whoa, strike the rock, I mean, a rock? Like, God, couldn't we, like, strike a tree at least? I mean, at least we know if anything, sap might come out, something that's gonna look liquidy and not make me look like I've got egg on my face and nothing happens. Strike a rock? That sounds absurd. That's exactly what God has Moses to do, and it's gonna require a big measure of faith. So Moses would have to now move forward in faith, stepping out now in just complete trust of God to see him work. 
Now, Moses does it, doesn't give a big account other than just saying he struck the, walk, the rock and water came out. That's all, all we read. And the people drank of it. They saw what God uh, did through this and they were provided for it. It doesn't give a lot of response. You'd think, you know, it tie in. They just all danced around, you know, and, you know, uh, just pouring water on each other, just a big celebration. But he goes, he strikes the rock, water comes out. Now, as we look at scripture, we find what this rock is really representing. You know, it's not guesswork for us. It's not theories that we try to kind of, you know, fit into place. We see scriptures explained so well for us. Scriptures are the greatest commentary on scriptures because look at what we read. We covered this a, a, a number of Sundays ago, but 1 Corinthians 10, verse one to four, moreover, brethren, Paul says, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. See, Jesus came as the bread of life in the wilderness of sin, we saw that pictured to the manna that came. And now we see this wonderful picture of Jesus providing this water, that rock being a picture of Christ. Remember that encounter that Jesus had with that Samaritan woman, John chapter four, verse 13 to 15, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water is gonna thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Now, Jesus has come to quench that thirst that every person innately has. And that thirst is only satisfied through a relationship with him. But for people to have a right relationship with him, what needs to happen? Notice how, again, Moses got the, the water, he had to strike the rock. In the same way, and there's just a beautiful uh, typology and, and picture being given here. In the same way as Moses struck the rock, Jesus was stricken for us. Isaiah 53, Verse four to five says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. See, because of our sin, Jesus had to come and bear the punishment that was due us and, and do our sin. Jesus was stricken, he was crucified, that the penalty for sin could be paid. He took the death blow of God's judgment and wrath that we could be spared. And because of his death and resurrection and now our faith in him, we now get to experience and be recipients of that living water that flows out now on a daily basis for us. It's this living water that quenches the deepest longing that every person has innately within. Remember what Jesus said in John 7, verse 37 to 39, on that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit who those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. See, many people have not experienced that satisfying drink because they've never come to that place of recognizing their need for Jesus and recognize that Jesus has done the work for them to be saved, for them to be healed and for them to receive that living water that quenches the deepest need and thirst within. He bore all of our sin and shame so that we would not have to. All we need to do now is believe just as the scripture says. It's quite simple, isn't it? Believe that Jesus is the son of God and that by believing in him, we have everlasting life. But for many, they, they put the, the burden on their own shoulders. They feel that, that heaven is theirs if they earn it. Eternal life is theirs if they're a good enough person. 
I know you all know, but let me just remind you, you cannot earn your salvation. You cannot do anything to add to the work that Jesus has accomplished because he's accomplished it completely. The debt is paid in full, he said on the cross. We have to learn to turn to the one who has provided it for us free of charge and put our complete trust and dependence on him. And that's why there are so many people today that are still, you know, in the world trying to fulfill that need within. And they're trying to fill that, that void with alcohol or drugs or ex- illicit relationships in an, attempt just, in an attempt just to quench that thirst. There's something that's lacking that can only be quenched and filled in and through a right relationship with Jesus Christ. He is that rock where the water flows from. It's, it's such a great picture of what we see Jesus has done for us. Now interestingly, a number of years later, Israel's gonna come upon a very similar situation. Numbers 20 gives us this account. And in like manner, the people were thirsty and they complained. But this time, God told Moses, Moses, I want you to speak to the rock. Speak to the rock and water will flow out. But Moses at this point now, in frustration of the people's continued complaining, he takes his rod and he strikes the rock twice. And he gets angry at the people of Israel. Now God in his mercy allowed water to flow. But there was a cost to Moses. God said, Moses, because you've not hallowed my name in front of Israel, because you have misrepresented me, you're gonna be kept out of the promised land. Moses was unable to lead the people all the way. That was a serious offense that God held there in Moses misrepresenting God. And in so doing, uh, ruining the type that was being filled because you see, they came to the rock the first time, the rock needs to be struck. Jesus was stricken for our sin. But now, when we're dry and empty, we don't need to see Jesus struck again on the cross. We just need to speak to him. We just need to turn to him and call it to him. And he gives that living water freely to those that ask. He pours out a spirit upon those that simply ask. We just need to speak to the rock today. It's a wonderful blessing that we have in that. So a great type and picture that we see in Christ through this. Look at what we read in verse seven. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the contention of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? So Massa means testing or temptation. Meribah means strife or quarreling. With all that Israel has seen and been through, there, there should be no room any longer for testing or quarreling and certainly no room for complaining against God based on what they've already seen God do. I mean, it got so low, they're, they're even questioning if the Lord is with them. I mean, complaining and grumbling is certainly going to cause us to fail to see how good God is and to see that he is with us. And again, the sad thing is that it's only been a short while that they've been miraculously delivered out of Egypt, seeing the Red Sea parted for their escape, seeing bitter waters made pure, given manna to feast on each day, not to mention having God guiding them by day and at night in a wonderful uh, way of provision. God has been overwhelmingly visible and gracious to them. And yet here they are, just complaining. And, And so these Israelites are learning some valuable lessons through all this, namely that God And and here's what God is really seeking to to instill into them, and it's this, that God does not exist to pamper them. They exist to praise him. That's something we have to grasp ourselves. 
So I think we so easily can get in that place when things are not, again, lining up like we want. Things are not unfolding or falling into places we would like them to. We can easily begin to question God and get angry at God. But here's the thing. God doesn't exist to pamper you. We exist to simply praise him and to live in him. Israel has thought that God maybe owes them, that God's the one that has redeemed them and delivered them. And if anything, Israel needs to see how their lives are to be lived in constant surrender to the Lord. See, when we fall prey to thoughts that that God owes us, then we quickly get unsettled when things are not going the way we want them to, right? I'm sure we've all experienced that. We quickly turn to complaining and grumbling rather than contentment and gratitude. God is good, guys, and he does all things well. And we may not always see what God's doing, right? But we know that God is good and faithful. And we know that whatever we're in right now, the outcome that God is working in and and through that is gonna be to our blessing, and it's gonna be for his glory. That's what we rejoice in, how we need to learn to rest in him. Interestingly, the place that they're brought to, Rephidim, that got changed to Massa and Meribah, well, here's what Rephidim means. It means resting place. If they had learned (laughs) to just come to Rephidim and do what it means to just rest in the Lord. God, there's no water. Well, we're gonna rest in you. We're gonna trust you. We're gonna turn to you and not turn on you. We're gonna look to you for our help. A grumbling spirit brings a lack of rest, doesn't it? Learn to trust the Lord and learn to trust the Lord in the difficult, dry places because these are opportunities for him to work in us in a way that will strengthen and mature us in him. That's God's intent. That's God's desire. So these tests then become less of an irritant and more of a blessing. God's not out to hurt you. God's not trying to test you to fail you or disqualify you. He's testing you to grow you. So that when those times come, there'll be less reason to grumble and more cause to just rejoice because you know God's at work. And you know God's gonna be faithful and see you through. Well, ready for more tests? Look at verse eight. (laughs) Now, Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Oh, joy. This is wonderful. Just when they thought, okay, we're doing all right. No, no. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So soon after Israel receives this water, again, which pictures salvation and the Holy Spirit coming and and dwelling within us, look at what happens. The battle begins. Again, a wonderful type and picture we're gonna see unfolding here. Now, first of all, Amalek, who's Amalek? Well, Amalek is a descendant of Esau, and the Amalekites are throughout scripture, not only a thorn in the side of Israel, but they are a type of the flesh. They're a picture of our flesh. Again, the picture is quite perfect because when a life is given to Christ and the Holy Spirit is now dwelling in you, well, guess what? The flesh opposes it. Our, our old nature, that's what I mean by the flesh, the, the old person, the old nature. See, the flesh was once ruling. The flesh was once at the top, king of the domain. Flesh had it all going on. But now through the Lord's transformation and regeneration through repentance and faith in him, guess what? The flesh gets shoved down in the basement. The flesh doesn't like it down there. So the flesh is constantly trying to get back up on top and there's a battle that ensues. And Amalek and the Amalekites are picturing that battle that's waging with this new life of Israel that they've experienced in and through the rock providing water. Jesus is that rock. See, we're never fully rid of that old nature until we enter into the glory of the Lord. Like 1 Corinthians 15 says, uh, 15 says that we're gonna put off, in corruption, we're gonna, we're gonna put off 
uh, mortality. We're gonna put on incorruption, we're gonna put on uh, immortality. So we're never rid of that, of that flesh. I'm sure you all know firsthand what that struggle is like, right? Between the flesh and the spirit. Even Paul knew it well. And look at what he wrote in Romans 7, verse 18 and 19. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Paul recognized there, there's a battle going on. And the flesh is seeking to constantly gain the dominance that it once had. Now again, the Amalekites are that type of our flesh that's in constant opposition to our new spirit nature. So what are we to do? Well, remember God, interestingly, told Saul, King Saul. Remember in 1 Samuel 15, verse 13, God told Saul, I want you to utterly destroy the Amalekites and don't spare anything. Leave nothing alive because God saw the perpetual problem that they were. I want you to utterly destroy the Amalekites. But we find later in that chapter that Saul, what did he do? He spared King Agag and he spared some of the, the choice possessions of the Amalekites. And it wasn't good. It wasn't good. Romans 13 verse 14 says, make no provision for the flesh. And Saul allowed some provision for the Amalekites to continue on. He did that and it'll be the thing that will later destroy him because in 2 Samuel chapter one, we find that it was an Amalekite that put the final sword in Saul that killed him. Saul had the opportunity to wipe out the Amalekites and he chose not to. He allowed some of it to remain and it eventually destroyed him. You see, if we do not crucify the flesh, it will wage war against us and can ultimately cause our demise. We've seen that happen many times. We've seen it happen sadly with, with pastors that fall prey to the flesh and enter into relationships, adulterous relationships, and are just destroyed by it. In fact, throughout the Bible, we see because of Saul's actions, it potentially caused even greater harm. Haman, who sought to exterminate the Jews in Esther, Haman was a descendant of Agag that Saul spared of the Amalekites. The point is this, we know that we're engaged in an ongoing battle because we have a very real enemy of our souls. And he works through the world, he works through our flesh to try and drag us down. And his intent is one thing and one thing only, and that is to destroy you, to wipe you out. But we have one who is greater, one who helps us in our time of need. Notice what we read in verse 10. The story just gets better here. So Joshua did as Moses said to him, and he fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So look who goes out into battle, Joshua. This is the first time that Joshua leaps onto the pages of scripture for us. This is the introduction of Joshua, and Joshua is going out, fighting in the battle. Going forward as that captain of the army where he's gonna gain great experiences in eventually being Moses' successor and leading the nation of Israel. But notice, what is he doing? He's submitting to Moses. He's doing just as he said, and he's fighting Amalek. Joshua means Jehovah is salvation. It's the Hebrew equivalent of the name Jesus. Jehovah is salvation. Just as Joshua submitted to Moses, Jesus came and he submitted to the will of the Father. He went on and provided a great victory for us in defeating sin and Satan to where we no longer need to succumb to the enemy's plots. We no longer need to walk in defeat. Paul would continue to say in that passage in Romans 7 when he says, oh, the things that I wanna do, I don't do, but the things I don't wanna do, those things I find myself doing. But he says at the end of Romans 7, verse 24 to 25, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He provides the victory for us. 
But notice it's not just relying on Joshua, who's in the battle. This victory was also brought about by what was taking place behind the scenes through prayer. Look at verse 11. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. What a great picture, huh? Here's Moses holding up his hand, which was taking a posture of prayer. We see that throughout scripture. Paul told Timothy, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And you see, as long as Moses was interceding, Israel was prevailing. Prayer was driving the battle and what was taking place in that battle. So what we see here is that the secret of waging war against the flesh is not to just try and outmuscle it and, and govern it, it's to pray. And we see the importance of prayer all throughout scripture. Colossians 4, 2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. That's kind of like that, that watch, the vigilant, watchful. It's like, you know, being on guard, right? We need to be on guard from the enemy through prayer. First Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Let that be an ongoing thing. Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope, patient tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Now Moses, <laughs> I'm sure as much as he tried, wasn't able to stay too steadfast in prayer. His arms got tired, right? You ever get tired when praying? Let's not give Moses a hard time on this, right? We've absolutely been there. But Moses noticed this. He looked to those around him. He needed help from others to lift up his hands. Prayer is of vital importance, but what this teaches us is that there's something dynamic about joining with others and interceding and praying alongside others. The early church often gathered together to pray and join together. And that too reflects the importance of the body. And we talked about this on Sunday, the importance of the body, everybody having a part to play. No, there, there are no uh, insignificant or unimportant roles to play in the body. Aaron and her might've been sitting there going, well, Moses, it's, it's a great view up here, but I don't know what good we're doing. So they're like, oh, Moses' hands are dropping and Israel's losing? Well, what can we do? Well, let's hold up your hands. That might've seen very insignificant. I'm sure if Moses told them, hey guys, why don't you come up the mountain with me and I need you to just kind of hold my hands. They'd be like, what? What are you talking about? Hold your hand. That's kind of weird. Why, why do we need to do that? Like, but here they are now and they're having a significant role in seeing victory being accomplished. See, the lesson is clear. We're all needed. We all have a part to play. Without Aaron and her, Moses would not have been able to remain in that posture of prayer. And what took place in the Mount of Intercession impacted what was happening in the Valley of Interaction. Leonard Ravenhill, the great author and preacher on, on revival and such said this, the church has many organizers, but few agonizers. Many who pray or pay, but few who pray. Many wrestlers, but few wrestlers. Many who are enterprising, but few who are interceding. People who are not praying and praying. The secret of praying is praying in secret. A worldly Christian will stop praying and a praying Christian will stop worldliness. Ties may build a church, but tears will give it life. That's the difference between the modern church and the early church. In the matter of effective praying, never have so many left so much to so few. Brethren, let us pray. And I pray we see the value of prayer. Praying in secret, joining with others in prayer, and just interceding one for another, interceding for things going on in the world, interceding for strength that people will continue on walking in victory that the Lord has provided. 
So we see that there's a great contributing combination going on now in this battle in which aids us in fighting against our flesh. Because notice it says at the end there of, uh, in verse 13, so Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So there's Moses, Aaron and her on either side, holding up his arms. They're praying, they're interceding, but there's Joshua with the sword. We see here pictured the word and prayer. How important that is. Paul would say when regarding the armor of the Lord that we're to be putting on and being clothed in daily. It says in Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. You know, the sword of the spirit is the only offensive weapon in the armor of God. Take that sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. The very word that we have here. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray always with all prayer, supplication. How we need to see these two combined in our lives in waging war against the flesh. We don't fight this in our own effort, in our own strength, in just trying to master the flesh. No, we continue to feed ourselves on the word of God that nourishes us and strengthens us, that weakens the flesh. We pray, we seek the Lord. But let's never forget that our reliance is always on Jesus who gives us the victory. Jesus, you see, is the greater Joshua. Jesus is the greater Moses. Jesus never needs to have hands held up. He never gets tired. Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore, he, Jesus, is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Well, lastly, verse 14 of Exodus 17, we read this. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. First time that we see, you know, Moses being called to record and to write down something here in scripture. Very interesting. And then in verse 15, and Moses built an altar and calls its name, the Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now notice something here, Moses is not, you know, putting up a plaque in honor of Joshua. Oh, Joshua, man. Oh, if it weren't for you, Joshua, boy, we would have been doomed. We're going to put up a plaque on Joshua. We'll give the rest of Israel participation medals, that kind of thing. He's not doing that. Moses is not trying to, you know, put in a, a, a name for himself here. No, this is an altar that's in honor of the Lord because he recognizes it's the Lord that's provided the victory here. He's the one that brought this all together. And so he names it Yahweh Nisi, compound name of God, which as it records here, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. What's that mean? It means that they fought under the standard or covering of the Lord. They were representing God and God was representing them. God was fighting for them and they're, they're fighting under that banner, under that standard of the Lord. Now, interestingly, there's kind of an obscure meaning in the Hebrew of verse 16. Some kind of untranslated words. It just says, because the Lord is sworn, but more literally, it reads, because a hand is upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord is sworn. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, that could be in reference to Moses' hands that were lifted up to heaven, kind of in that show of intercession and dependence on the Lord, it could also mean that Amalek, you know, kind of put his hand up against the Lord, kind of shaking his hand at the Lord saying, ah, we're not going to follow you. And because of it, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Either way, we see that Amalek will be a thorn in the side of Israel. In the same way, we need to see and recognize, guys, that nothing good comes from our flesh. And it, it wants to be a thorn in your side. The enemy loves to provoke and push the flesh to try to get us to succumb to sin, to fall into areas of temptation. But we need to be certain that we do battle with the flesh, 
leaning on the victory that the Lord has already provided for us. Romans 6, verse 10 and 12 says, for the death that Jesus died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. We don't have to allow the flesh to have its way. We need to crucify the flesh. Reckon yourselves, consider yourselves, count yourselves dead to sin. Why? Because Jesus has already defeated it. And he's alive today. And he lives to God. May we be those that live in Christ and live to God. Allowing the spirit to fill us strengthen us the spirit that's we've seen tonight been poured out in our lives it's all the spirit to strengthen us equip us that we might walk in a manner that glorifies the lord represents him in in all that we do